You can be a spectator in life or you can be a participant. You chose and I chose that day to be a participant. It didn't work out. But that's a lot better than sitting on the sidelines and being a spectator and judging you and I saying, oh, it didn't work out. I can't do that. Yeah. You know? So we're, we're participants, man. We're participants in life. And you can be a participant or a spectator. And if you're a participant, it doesn't always work out. If you're a spectator, it never works out. So how are you? I'm doing good, Rach. Thank you. This good. is my, you know, this is my first podcast in like a year. Really? Oh, I feel yeah. I feel very blessed by you taking the time because I know you're super busy. And I'm geeking out today because I've wanted to have you on the show for years. So this feels like uh, it's already so good because I've gotten to learn so much from you personally over the last couple of years of getting to know you. Um, and I just know that the audience is going to like have their brain and heart explode from this conversation. So I'm pumped. I love it. I love it. Good. Same. I'm excited. To, I'm excited to talk to you. Well, so, I mean, honestly, Jesse, we could go in 1,000 directions. I have a really specific sort of way that I want to lean today, which is talking about this concept of a life resume, because I think it's life-changing perspective for, it was for me, and I think will be for listeners. But before we jump into it, could you just give, and I know your, your resume is so long, but could you just give a little context to listeners who might not be familiar with your your backstory is so diverse and full like I was having a breakfast with my boyfriend this morning and he's like make sure he talks about the fact that he was like in hip-hop and what <laughs> that is and so um can you just tell a little bit of your backstory yeah I mean I had a very unconventional journey as an entrepreneur I started out in the music business as a rapper I know that sounds crazy um and then from there um, navigated, pivoted into, um, I did jingles for corporations and sports teams. I managed Run DMC. I had a private jet company that we sold to Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway's NetJets. I had a, a coconut water company we sold to Co uh, to called Zico that we sold to Coca-Cola. Um, I was in, in um, you know, I've been an author. I've been a speaker. I've been I've had a lot of egg on my face. I had a fitness company called 29 or 29 that you were a part of where yep, we climbed yep. these mountains. Uh, but you know, the common theme through all this stuff is, which is crazy, Rachel, I had no prior experience in anything, in, in music, in beverage, in entertainment, nothing. And that, for a lot of people, that's a big deterrent and can be really scary. But for me, it was, it was a great advantage because it guaranteed that everything I did would be different than my competition and I would get different results and I would do it my own way without being taught. And that was the common thread throughout all these things. So um, once I did one thing like music, my dad owned the plumbing supply house. I had no lawyer. I had no entrance, you know, I had no like connections, nothing, but it, it built up this resilience and this grit around, you know, getting my foot in the door and figuring it out. And is that like you would just sort of lean into something you were interested in and then you'd figure it out once you were there? How did you, I mean, just starting with music, how did you even navigate that world? Yeah, well, music was different because I love, I love music. I love, I grew up in New York in the 80s when hip hop was coming on the scene. I was surrounded by it. I was really into it. When all my friends in college were like writing resumes, they're like, why aren't you writing a resume? I'm like, if I'm getting a record deal. I don't need a resume to write, get a record deal. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I did. And I was making, you know, a demo on my answering machine. That's how I made my original demo was making an instrumental, the music portion of a CD while that played, leaving a rap on my answering machine. And I sent that Stop. to record. Yeah. But that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and I was like fully committed. And by the way, 17 record companies passed on me until I finally got a small independent label to give me a chance, but, and, and several partners quit along the way because they couldn't handle the rejection. But at 19, 20 years old, when I was going through that journey, you know, um, getting the reward at the end of getting a deal, like having gone through that rejection and then realized like, whoa, 
The only reason why I got a deal and so many people that have been next to me along this journey didn't is because I stuck with it. It wasn't Bro, even the talent. Yes. It wasn't even that the talent. The, without question, that is it. That is the answer to every freaking successful person I know. It is a willingness to keep going. It's not like talent isn't going to win. Um, the best idea isn't going to win. It is who is willing to stand back up and keep trying when you get knocked down. And not just once but hundreds oh, yeah. of times. And every time you go into a new sector, a new industry, you have to do that all over again. I never worry about the how. Like when I started Marquee Jet, I was a kiddie pool attendant four years before we started this airplane company that did $5 billion in sales. Right. And if they would have said to me like, you need, you're gonna need FAA approval and Department of Transportation approval and raise money and build a sales force and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I was a kiddie pool attendant. Like, what are you talking about? Like. What was the first thing you said I needed? FAA approval? Well, there's got to be a lawyer that does that. Let me find that guy. And once we got that, what was the second thing I needed? Department of Transportation approval? There's got to be a lawyer that does that. I never worried about the how I was going to get it done in anything. Even when I signed yeah. up for ultra races, which I do, and endurance races, it's never like how. It's like, let me sign up. Let me commit to this and then figure out how. Because if you worry about how... It's going to be so overwhelming and scary. It's going to talk you out of trying. So Absolutely. to me, yeah, I mean, you did the same thing. You signed up for our race 29 or 29. And then you're like, all right, I'm going to figure out when I get to the friggin' mountain. Right. Exactly. Uh, right. Just, right. And it is literally all of these things, uh, you know, as runners or you're an endurance runner, you're a whole different category than I am. But even that is such a great allegory because it's just one foot in front of the other. That's literally all it is. It's just, okay. What's the next step? And what's the next step? And um, talking about the how, it reminds me. Uh, Tony Robbins has a term for that. He calls it the tyranny of how. That you'll sort of get so bogged down in obsessing over how you're going to pull it off that you lose sight of what. Like you're not focusing on what. You're not focusing on the passion you have for what this could be. You get obsessed with but how, but how, but how. Or maybe the people in your life get obsessed with the how, and you talk yourself out of it. So I love that you say that. And also, I'm glad you brought up Marquis because my understanding of that time period, and please tell me if I'm wrong, it was not a thing to have a company that was renting out private jets. I, am I mistaken in that you were really disruptive in that market? Yeah. At the time, really, the only way to fly on a private plane was to buy your own. Like, who is $50 million to buy their own plane? <laughs> right. Or to or to charter one. And there were a lot of questions around charter, like who's flying the plane? You know, there were just a lot of questions around the, around that. So we came up with this category really of a jet card. And so people, and that imagine, you know, for any entrepreneur out there, anybody that has an idea, you know, as entrepreneurs, really, we can do two things. We can either invent something new that doesn't exist or make something better. Yeah. That's really, that's what we do. And Usually when you come up with a new idea, or in this case, a new category, you're going to get met, anybody out there, with a lot of resistance. You don't have enough experience. If this is such a good idea, why haven't the big guys done it? You know, and, and you're going to get that. And you know, we were faced with a lot of that. So imagine going into my father's, my, my parents' house. And you know, I've had, by the way, at this stage of my life also, I had no resume. I got dropped as a rapper. I was, I sold meat and chicken door to door. I stunk at it. I had like eight things that failed. I was a kiddie pool attendant. I wasn't even, I wasn't even a lifeguard. I worked at the kiddie <laughs> pool because I wasn't even certified. I can't even swim. Man. And I go to my parents and they're like, so what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm starting a private jet company. They're like, my dad was like, what are you talking about? With what airplanes? With what money? Wait, what? Where did that idea come from? Was it your concept, or did you meet someone? Like, I yeah. feel like I've heard you talk about like being. Um, I've heard you on a podcast where we're talking about like you would go to the same restaurant every day. You'd like tip the maitre d' and like make it your thing. Like you were out there and sort of networking and trying to glean without maybe having a connection yet. Is that right? So I, I always believed in the end of my story, like I, which is so important as. As, an, as anybody, if you're single, you have to believe he or she's out there. If you're yeah. an entrepreneur, you have to believe. I always knew I was onto something. I just didn't know what that would, what that would be. So I was, I was always looking for clues. 
I would go into bookstores and I look at the packaging of the book covers. I go into Whole Foods and I look at what's hot in the beverage section. I was just always aware, thinking like, what will be my idea? And I was, and because I was in that space already, I was a guest on a private plane, like just on a fluke. And when I walked onto the plane, my partner and I were like, people travel like this? This is nuts. Like, how do, we need to do this. I want to do yeah. this. And that led to the research around how could we do it and this idea of a 25-hour jet card where you could get all the benefits of owning your own plane without having to buy a plane. And that, yeah. that's sort of how it started. That so is how it cool. started. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, I want to circle back to something you said because it's really intriguing. You said you're looking for clues. What does a clue look like in your mind as you're building or considering building a new company? I would say less about clues and more more about just being aware, like putting myself in in a state of mind where um, I'm like, okay, I don't have my idea. I'm going to have an idea for a business. I just don't know what it is yet. Is a lot different. So you you know you're always like aware of oh yeah wow, you're cool open idea. like you said to me how did you think of that idea you're in a different yeah frequency than someone that's going on a nine to five and just like this is my life right. I can't get out of this this is what I do so my internal talk was like to myself I was Albert Einstein <laughs> you know like <laughs> I just didn't have an invention yet yeah you know like. I used to walk into my office when I was um, um, with my partner. I had nothing. I made $37,000 till I was 27 years old. And I used to walk into my office and I would turn to my partner and be like, we're millionaires. They just haven't paid us yet. Like, that's how we thought. Yeah. You know, like, we really, like, I was convinced myself that something big was on the horizon. So that's what I mean. Like, I was in that, that was my frequency in my 20s. Yeah. Even during the failures and even during the egg on my face and even getting dropped from the label and getting rejected. And that's what I, so I, so I was in a trial and error state and, and marquee was something that we tried and worked big time. And yeah. Big time. I'm curious. I have an instinct about this answer, but are you, how are you as a networker or how were you back then? Like you strike me as someone that's I mean, I know you as a human, like I've seen you interact with every kind of person at 29 or 29, but like, are you good at those relationships, those connections back in the day? Was that a big part of your success or are you successful because you sort of laser focus and get stuff done on your own? I was the best in the world at it. <laughs> well, tell us how, I mean, what, no, so, so was that the way that you were, came into the world or is that something you learned over time? I was never the I was never the smartest in the room. I got a 980 on my SATs. I was never like the guy that read a balance sheet. I didn't know, like I didn't come I didn't grow up in that household where that was discussed. We didn't talk about money. So my default mechanism was two things. Storytelling and humor. I would get oh, I would be able to navigate meetings. I would beg Rachel when I went into big meetings, I would beg that they didn't call on me because I didn't know what the hell anyone was talking about when they were talking about like the budgets and stuff. And if they did, I would deflect it with like, let me tell you guys what happened to me this weekend into a story about <laughs> nothing, make them laugh and be like, okay, go to the next question. Like get out. And I would get out of it. You know, I was like, um, so networking was one of those things that I had to get really good at because it didn't require high intelligence, high scores, or, or a degree in business. I had none of that. I love people. So it came really naturally to me. And, you know, all kinds of people, janitor to CEO. Yeah. And I always, I, I built my network when I had no money. In my 20s, intuitively, I sent 10 thank you notes a day. So I sent 3,000 letters, handwritten letters in my early 20s. That was my marketing and networking plan. And I continue to do that today. Wait, I you sent 10 thank you every notes day. every day. To who? Anyone, everybody that I came across that impacted me. So if, if I would send you a thank you note after this, I would, yeah. send, I would send anyone that I had a meeting with would get a thank you note. 
if I had a dinner and there were six people at the dinner, I would send everyone to know, great to meet you. Let's stay, you know, and, but it, that was what I did. And, um, so I did that. Uh, I invited people to everything. If I was going to a local polar plunge that the fire department had in New York city, <laughs> New, Island, New Year's Eve, like, and you know, you could sign up for a team of 20. I would sign up 20 people and invite them. And even if they said no, People love getting an invitation. They love that I thought about them. So I was super inclusive and, 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 I, and I still am. So yeah. um, I, would, I, I made it a point for things that didn't cost money to, to be inclusive with people. And everything that I did in my networking, and this is still today, this is still true. I could give a, I could give a masterclass in this. It was one way. I never asked for anything in return. Yeah. Ever. And um, ever, like everything was just like, if I knew Rachel, if I knew you were into roller skating, I'd send you a, a YouTube video. Rachel, I know you're into roller skating. Check out this video on how to master roller skating in 10 minutes or less. That doesn't cost me anything, but you appreciate it because I thought right. about you. So I did that. I would show up at places that didn't cost money that were hot spots. So for example, I lived on my friend's couch. I lived on 18 couches between wow. 19 and 22. But when I lived in LA on couch number five, my friend John Cornick's place in Burbank, we went to lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel. That was what I've heard you talk about. Yes, I'm, the story. I'm sitting at the, can I tell the story? Yes, no, I, yes. Want, I want the audience no. to hear it. We go to lunch. I'm sleeping on this guy's couch. I'm living out of my suitcase. And I'm looking around, I'm like, that's Russell Simmons. That's the guy that runs Miramax. That's the head of Warner Brothers TV. They're all at the Beverly Hills at the Polo Lounge for lunch. And I'm like, you don't have to be a, a guest at the hotel for $4,000 a night to come to lunch at the Polo Club? He's like, no, you got to order a salad. So I went, that became my office. I went there every day, literally. And I would have a salad and like a glass of water. For like water? <laughs> And I would sit there for like, I sit there for like four hours, but I started be getting facial association with everybody. I started watching the mannerisms of the experts. How do they tip? How do they do? They stand up to greet people. Like I was a twenty-one year old kid. I, I was a sponge. So I'm watching this environment of the wealthiest movers and shakers. Then I go back and I sleep on my friend's couch with five other guys in the in the house. But I'm picking up these habits. But more importantly. I'm in the bathroom with the guy. Hey, can I get you this? Can I open the door? Can I? And I'm being noticed. Years later, there's facial recognition. As, as my star starts to shine brighter, I'm bumping into the same guys at the restaurants. I'm bumping into the same guys at the, at the hot spots. So I put myself, part of the networking was being in the environment. Part of it was really extending, casting a wide net through things that didn't cost any money. And part of it was being really inclusive to the people already in my network. So you so you said a couple of things that I think are freaking genius. And I just want to take note of one, the idea of the thank you notes. I love because not only are you keeping those connections strong two, it's not something people do anymore. Even when you were doing it, it wasn't a common practice to hand write a note to someone. So it gets noticed. And then the third thing is I think, even though you're giving something to someone else, you're grounding yourself in gratitude. You're creating a world that says, all these people are here. I have abundance in my life. I've got connections. Look at all these resources I have, which is just such a beautiful state to create. And then you're also, it's like, if you've seen Hamilton, and I have to believe you have because you love hip hop, um, you're putting yourself in the room where it happens. So you're almost like living the life you want to have before you're able to live the life that you have, which is so genius. And by the way, I feel like we did all just get a masterclass in networking <laughs> because most people who talk about networking, it feels creepy. It feels slimy. It feels like you're only looking for how people can best serve you. And I do, I know this about you because I've gotten to hang out with you. You are like, let me give you information. Let me give you ideas. Let me give you resources. You're not like looking for who's going to hook you up with the next thing. So I no. feel like that was like, those are golden nuggets for us. Well, let, let, let me give you, let me give you two other things that I think are really important. If you were to invest 
three minutes a day. So there's no way everybody listening here can invest, if it's important to them, three minutes a day. So yeah. if, you were to, if you were to send a, a DM, an email, or a handwritten letter, let's say it took a minute, for me to send you, hey, Rach, thanks for having me on today. Great to catch up. Love seeing you. I'm a super fan of you. To be on your show is amazing. Thank you. Boom. It takes me 20 seconds. So if I did that for three minutes a day and I sent three texts, DMs, handwritten letters, or emails, over the course of a year, if I'm consistent, that's 1,000 seeds planted. That's 1,000 people you will hit. Now, not everyone's going to buy your product. Not everyone's going to be a customer. But if you plant a thousand seeds, you only need one. Yep. You know, one person to change the course of your life, one buyer, one referral. So if you do that one day, nothing's going to happen. If you do that for a year and you cast a thousand seeds, a couple of those will grow to be trees. So I'm very consistent. A part of my business today. And I'm still like, I have an underdog mentality. I have a, <laughs> I sold five yeah. businesses, five. You're businesses. the world's wealthiest underdog. You yeah. Really no, but I have to live like that because yeah. that, that, I got to stay hungry. I got to stay in that zone. So I still do this and I do it in the carpool line. I still, you know, boom, I knock out three texts every day, picking up my kids. But over the course of time, that that's how you network. It's consistency. You know how many, you, 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 this, is, this is getting me on a sidetrack. There's like 2 million podcasts on, in the Apple library. Do you know that 500,000 of them only have one episode of their podcast? Wow. A quarter, 25%. If that's the competition that they do one and like, oh my God, I didn't strike gold. The advertisers aren't calling me up and they quit. If that's the state of this country and the world, I like my chances. Yeah. <laughs> All I got to do is do two podcasts and I'm in the top, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically in the top 75% just because of I want to one extra effort. So right. like I'm insanely consistent. I don't, I don't quit off of after one little thing. I mean, these aren't like super skills. These are just no, like, uh, yes, I know it. I know it. Three minutes a day. Take three minutes a day and Plant those seeds, man. And you know, you know, you talked about the handwritten letter and like how unusual it is. I have four kids. If my kids get a handwritten letter, it's like Christmas. They freak out. You know, I part of being an entrepreneur or a business person is breaking through the clutter. And we all get emails. We all get bombarded with email, emails, texts, DMs. And a lot of times we don't read them. Or they get sifted through by an assistant or they go into spam. Have you ever received a letter that you haven't read? You read yeah, every no letter. Way. No, of no course. way. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And the universe, for me to send an email takes a second, blah, 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 send. To get a stamp, write, a, write something, get a stamp, lick the envelope, walk to the mailbox, put it in the mailbox. That's a whole different energy that I'm sending towards our relationship than a one second email. Yeah. And that's you know, good. like Rachel, listen, man, I built my entire career caring the most. I'm dead friggin' serious. I just marquee jet, like I cared about the customers. I network. I I don't network to network. I care about the people I send the DMs to. I don't waste time. I don't like say, oh, I have to who I have to get a quote of three. There's people I care about. And when I put the effort in through a stamp and a letter and this, they Feel that as a recipient and they return that to me, you know, and I've built, you could go through everybody in my phone book and they'll all randomly pick anyone. They'll say the same thing. Yeah. And this guy cares, man, about me and anyone can do that. And they don't teach that in school. You know, they don't teach that. And whoever's listening to this, you, there's no reason why you shouldn't be the person that cares the most about whatever it is you do. Whatever you do for a living, you should be known as the person that cares the most because customers feel that. Well, and I think you're 100% right, but also I think this is becoming something that people are afraid to do because if you show that you care and it doesn't work, people who can't 
see me, I'm doing air quotes. It doesn't work the way you think it should, which is an external validation of what you're doing. Then, oh God, the world knows that I didn't succeed at the thing I was really passionate about. I feel like people are more afraid than ever to admit, like I believe in this project so much. I want this so much. I'm going to work the hardest. I'm going to show up with my whole heart and do my very best. I feel like we're in this game now of like, oh, it's okay. It didn't work and it's fine because I wasn't that into it. So how do you or can you counsel people who are like, yeah, but if they know that I care, I know this sounds counterintuitive because you and I are both people who are like fucking whole hearts, right? Right. But if someone's listening to this, they're like, oh, but then they're going to know. Then they're really going to watch me fail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the question a little bit to the left. But, you know, people think of return on investment in dollars or ratings or whatever. Return on investment comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. It's not just money or bottom line. And for me... The return on the investment sometimes is the impact that I have on people. Same with you. I mean, you're in the impact business. It's the impact that I have on people. It's how it makes me feel. See, the one thing everybody listening to this, they listen to your show for a bunch of different reasons. Either they want to get nuggets, they want to get advice. Who knows? But the one thing every listener, you and I included, have in common, everybody, the one thing is we want to feel good. We want to feel good. So, I, you know, it makes me feel good. I don't care what the response is. It makes me feel good. So I can't control every book review. I can't control the comments. I can't control this one feels. None of us can. And if you want to be in business, you have to have much thicker skin than that. You know, you have to be able to deal with disappointment, deal with being embarrassed, deal with how, other, what you know, not worry about what other people. And that's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But that's a reality. But the return on investment and how you feel is what matters most. Yeah. And, you know, so you want to do things that make you feel good. Like, this is what I, this, this, this could be like, this is the million dollars of the interview right here. This is the million dollars right here. Okay. We're ready. We're all ready. I've sold five businesses. I've had a lot of failures, but I have had five businesses that have sold to major companies, the feeling that you get when you sell a company, when the wire hits your account, is the same feeling, it's the same feeling that you get, remember we're talking about how you feel, that you get when you finish a race, 29 or 29, the marathon, a 5K, when you walk an old lady across the street, or when you do something that makes you feel good to somebody else, it's the same feeling. You're right. Now, People think, people think you have to wait till you have an event like you sell a company, like my wife sold Spanx or I sold Marquee Jet to have that feeling. Or you have to climb Mount Everest to get that feeling. When, you, when anyone listening realizes that you can get that feeling every day, when you understand that and you can bottle that feeling of selling a company or climbing Mount Everest every day, through things that you do, you won life. Yes. You won life. You won life. Yes. You, won, you won like game over. Yes. If you wait 10 years for like, oh, if I do this, I'll feel that way. You're waiting to catch up to life. A hundred percent. Instead of just taking life every day. And, and, you know, I understand people are in different circumstances financially. I understand people have different opportunities. But I truly believe that anybody can have that feeling. Because yeah. it, can, it can live under your own roof. So I, I really, like that to me, that's how I live my life. You talked about building your life resume, but to me, that's the most important thing. It's like that feeling, I don't want to wait once every 20 years to have a monumental event to feel that. Right, And I right. feel like I can get that every day. Right, and it's worth saying, like, it, it's not that, I hate that, um, there's that expression that's like, well, money doesn't buy happiness. It fucking helps. It really helps if you can pay your bills on time, if you can pay rent, if you can take care of your babies, like it does buy a lot of things. So it's not that attitude, but as someone who has also achieved a lot of external success, I could not agree with you more. Those feelings, when you do the biggest things, when you've, you know, 
finally number one on the New York Times bestseller list, a fucking lifetime of trying to get to that place. You're elated and it's amazing for 30 minutes. Yeah, like that exactly. feeling is short lived. It's, it's incredible. And I'm not taking anything away from it, but I, it's so crazy that you say this because I was walking back from the gym today and I have this habit that I've done for a decade that I never noticed I had until I met my boyfriend. Cause we walk a lot and he noticed this about me. So for the longest time back, probably since I didn't have any money. Um, I am constantly, if I'm walking anywhere, New York, Brooklyn, LA, Austin, I am constantly scanning the ground. I scan the ground, scan the ground. And as I walk, I collect nails. It's shocking how many rusty nails are on footpaths, are in driveways, are on the road. They're everywhere. And I just, I had done it forever. I collect them and at the end of my walk, I throw them away. (laughs) <laughs> and I didn't notice this until he was like, what are you doing? When we first met, he's like, why do you collect rusty nails? And I said, oh, it's going to make me emotional because when I was poor and living in LA and working three jobs, I had the shittiest car ever and I ran over a nail and it punctured my tire and it fucking ruined my life for like six months because I could not afford I had to, to be able to get to work. I had to be able to change out that tire, but I couldn't afford the money that it was. And it set me back so bad financially. So it's the simplest, stupidest thing. But I always think, man, if I could grab this nail off the ground, maybe someone doesn't step on it when they're running. Someone doesn't puncture their bike tire or someone doesn't hurt their car when they really can't afford to do this thing. And as I was walking back from the gym this morning, I saw a nail, picked it up, walked over, put it in a trash can. And it always makes you feel good because I'm like, I'm looking out for other people and they're never going to know that I saved them from the nail in the parking lot. I know it sounds stupid, but it really is true that every day you could do things that make you feel good about the world you're living in and the people you're showing up for. I don't, I don't think it sounds stupid at all. And you know, you said money, money can buy, can't people say money can't buy you happiness. And you said it can, it can. And by the way, so can a lot of other things. Right. It's not just money that buys you happiness. Right. Right. And little things like that. Like I feel the same way about picking up litter, anything you do that makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah. Is a win. Yeah. And people forget that, man. And, or they wait for things to happen to them that like will change their course when it's like things you can do that can change your course. Yeah. And anyone that's going through like a downward spiral or feels stuck or overwhelmed, the easiest stop plug, because if you give that power and momentum, it's hard, as you know, to turn that around. But the easiest stop plug is to do something that makes you feel accomplished or good about yourself. And it can yeah. be a little, you know, little thing. So I, I totally get what you're saying about the nail. I actually like that really hits me. I get that a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, so this goes back to our original intention with this conversation, which is about the way that you live your life. And the whole reason I wanted to have you on the show is to talk about your perspective about how you approach your life, because it is, I never heard anybody explain this, but you and I think I heard it for the first time when we were traveling down a gondola at 29029. So I had about 15 minutes with you and you were like spouting wisdom. But can you tell the audience, what is this idea of a life resume and how did you come across this perspective? No, I mean, we spend so much time focusing on our traditional resume, which is important, but we often neglect what I think is more important, which is our life resume, which is the experiences we have, the memories we create, um, and all that. And I've really invested. I had a financial advisor that came. I've had 50 come trying to get our business. And usually they have the same logo, a different logo on the same kind of brochure, bonds and stocks. And what do you want to do? And a guy came in and he said to me, um, if you had a choice to leave your kids a boatload of money or a boatload of life experiences, what would you rather give them? And obviously I would rather give them life experiences. But I, I'm like, you get me. Like you really get me. The more you experience, the more you can offer. The more empathy you have, the more you can share with people, the more interesting you are. You know, people try to build up their traditional resume, Rach, and like to get bigger jobs. But I feel like if you do really cool shit, you become more interesting at work. People, it's when you're selling stuff, they want to know about it. It's contagious. It makes you happier. So like if you didn't do the things you wanted to do because your boyfriend 
wanted you to go to the opera. I'm making it up. Yeah. You would yeah. resent you'd resent your boyfriend or, or your yes. husband or your wife yes. or your partner for taking away what you love to do. And prioritizing yourself, prioritizing adventure, scheduling that stuff and playing life on offense, like prioritizing what you like to do, I think is is so important so important. And I think that, that that's been lost in translation. And let me just say one more thing. It all, the whole notion of having a life resume and living and like doing things that make you feel alive and feel and get excited. I could have something on my calendar three months from now that carries me through work because I'm excited about it. It's something to look forward to. Um, it all stems from your relationship with time. And most people, their relationship with time is very different than mine. It's very, I think, very warped. When you think of relationships, you think of them in terms of relationships with people like your kids or your partner, but you don't think of it in terms of your relationship with money. Like that's important. What's your relationship with money and what's your relationship with time? So let me give you an example. Do you have your, do you have your graveyard plot picked out? No. Right. So you think you're going to die though, right? One day? Yes, one day. But you don't, you don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, obviously, because if you did, you would have all your significant, your significant others would have your, your passwords for Instagram and social, you'd have your graveyard plot picked out. You'd be organized around that. But you, like probably 99.999% of the people listening, think there's no way anything like this could happen to me soon. So you, so what that's really telling me and yourself is I got time. Yeah. I have all the time in the world. And if you don't realize, and I'm not picking on you. No, I, 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 I don't give a moment. You could get diagnosed with something. I'm at that yeah. age now or my, you can get hit by a truck. Your circumstances can change. If you don't realize that you're not operating with true urgency, I'll do it next year. I'll start that this, I'm going to do this in three. And, and then inevitably Zoom calls, weddings, anniversaries, appointments start to take over your calendar. And now you have no time to do the things you wanted to do. So if I were to ask you, Rach, what did you do in 2015, 2018, 2021? You should be able to rattle off. What did you do eight days ago? You probably couldn't. Even- <laughs> what did you do eight days ago? You have no idea. Because like, yeah, no idea. Most of us, we, no, we cruise through life in, in our routine. That, that's what makes time seem so fast. And then all of a sudden, the average American is gaining two pounds between 35 and 65. They're 50 pounds overweight. They're 60 years old. They can't do the trip they wanted to do. You know, time is undefeated. No one's ever beaten time. Yep. The only way you can beat time is, if, is by doing things that time can't take away from you. Time can't take away your book launch. Time can't take away your 29 or 29. Time... Time can't take away your trip to Italy if you do it. You know, if you don't do it, time can. Oh, you got sick. Time got me. I'm old. Time got me. So you have, it's 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 a very important thing to remember. You got to be a doer. You have to realize like, man, I don't have the luxury of forever. So there's an, not to belabor this, but, but there's an old Japanese ritual and the ritual is called the misogi. And the notion around of Masogi, I took a liberty to, to change it a little bit, is that every year you do one year defining thing, right? That really defines your year. So if you're third, so that could be, I launched a podcast. I stopped smoking. I put out a book. I started 29 or 29, whatever. But every year you should be able to look back and be like, you know what? In 2023, I did this, like yeah. a year defining thing. Now imagine this. Imagine you're 30 years old and you're listening to this and you're like, this is, I don't know this Jesse guy. I never heard of him. This is ridiculous. But this concept stuck with me. And this year I'm going to do something really year defining. I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for a marathon. Okay. And next year, yeah, that that worked out good for me. I finished the marathon. I'm going to launch a podcast. And every year you do that till you're 70. If you put from 30 to 70, 40, 40 year defining things on your calendar and you did everything else the same, you would have a hell of a life. You would be like, look at my life resume. 
I ran a marathon. I launched a podcast. I swam with sharks. I stopped smoking. I traveled to Italy. You would have an unbelievable life resume. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's not, it's not ODing on my next career move. Because I'll tell you something. Someone wants to hire or promote the person that did those 40 things. Yeah, for sure. I want that person on my team. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think in my own experience, I think of the, again, the external successes that I've had or the financial successes that I've had, and they don't even hold a candle to what it felt like to cross the finish line at my first marathon. They don't even touch what it felt like to do 29029 and get that freaking red hat, which is the greatest marketing scheme in the history of the world. <laughs> like they don't hold a candle to jumping out of an airplane, which I did, swimming with sharks, which I did, which like you're my person that whenever I do something crazy, I might not have talked to Jess for like nine months and I'll just send him a text and it's me like flying out of an airplane because I'm like building my life resume. I it, love it really does. I can tap into the emotion of having accomplished those things at any point that I need it. Whereas I can't do that with the business or the career success. So I'm so aligned with this idea of um, how important it is to add these elements to our lives. And by the way, I feel just as powerful and amazing and proud of myself crossing my first 5k because I literally did not think I was capable of running a 5k as I did doing a marathon. It's about wherever you are now and making a choice wherever you are now that you could feel really proud of and inspired by. There's no doubt about it. You, you know, if you, it's also incredibly, first of all, think about how many memories you have over the last, do you remember any Zoom calls from two years ago? <laughs> no. no. Think about the memories that you have are the memories that are the most outrageous or scary or challenging or different than your everyday picture. We think in pictures. Yeah. And um, so creating those is just, it's just so important. What was, I forgot what I was gonna say about that. Oh, so, so I'm, I'm, if you spent 10 years at a cubicle, you would not get the relationship you would get through one adventure with a friend. Like you, the relationships you build at a cubicle over 10 years wouldn't even compare to running a 5K with your next door neighbor. Right. Like literally. Like, literally. So yeah. not only do you get the experience, but like for me, it's been an incredible like human bonding thing with my kids, with strangers, you know, with friends that I, I bring on board. And I can go back. So every year, last year I did a race called Ultraman. It was a- Was this the one where you like had to say, it? it's like you you run the- No, that was- Which was the one was, where you were like that, dying that in the woods? called The Last Man Standing. That one, that was insane. That was so Ultraman crazy. is a 6.4 mile open water swim, a oh. 265 mile bike ride, and a 52.4 mile run. Holy crap. And I did it with a friend of mine. And um, that was my Misogi for last year. And we're bonded for life. Like, I, I can't even explain the relationship. Now I'm not suggesting everybody go out and sign up for an extreme event, but I am suggesting that on top of your work and your everyday schedule, that you prioritize your own life before it's too late. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in your 30s, you think you have forever. In your, you know, in your 40s, you start to see a little difference. In your 50s, I'm going to be 54. That means in 26 years, I'm going to be eight. The average American lives to be 78. So if I'm average, I got 24 years left. If I'm average, I got 24 years left, 24 summers left, 24 times to ski. I ski one time a year. Like those things become really valuable to me. The visits that I have with my mom, I lost my dad this year, but... I'm you know, sorry, Jesse. I didn't my mom know that. Lives in, yeah, my mom lives in Florida. I live in Georgia. I see her, you know, a couple of times a year. But if my mom lives five more years, I only see her three times a year. I only have 15 visits. Like, I'm very mindful of that stuff. And it's changed the way that I, doesn't mean I don't, I don't work. Doesn't mean I don't have responsibilities and priorities. But 
I aggressively plan in advance my year. My 2023 is already laid out. I have a big calendar. I put yeah, on- talk about the calendar because you have a really smart tactic for this. Yeah. Well, I feel like if you don't plan it, it won't happen. I also feel like as you get older, creating newness is really hard. Where does newness come from? You live in routine. You have to plan it. So I feel like most of us, and I, I think probably most people listening to this would agree, play life on defense. We wait for people to request Oh, Rachel, will you join us for this Zoom call? Will you come to this charity event? Hey, Rach, can you give me 15 minutes? A good friend wants to pick your brain about being an, a new, new author. Our calendars fill up. Those are other people's requests for our time. We only get 52 weekends, and then the whole year is like we have no time to even do anything we want to do. So I've changed, flipped that model upside down, and I get this big calendar. I sell it. It's called the Big Yeah, you do. In any event... I'm not plugging it, but in any event, what I do is I map out as much of what I want to do in advance. So once it's on my calendar, I fill in all the other stuff, fills in around what I want to do, which is completely different, like prioritizing me versus my meetings. You know, like I used to prioritize my meetings. I still, my meetings still happen, but now my one-on-one trips with my kids, I take one one one-on-one trip with all four of our kids every year. My date night with Sarah. Sarah and I take once a quarter, we take a little overnight trip. It could be local or it could be a trip to New York, but once a quarter, it's not, you don't need a lot if you're in a relationship. You know, like you don't have to like, you don't need a lot. You have to just have a plan, you know? Yeah. So we have date nights. We go away once a quarter for a little steak. I take my kids and then I have my big event, my Misogi. And then I have, I take, I have this other thing that I do. I call it Kevin's rule where I take every other month, I do something I normally wouldn't have done. We don't, we can go into it or not. Yeah. What's where, who's Kevin? Kevin is a police officer. Kevin is who I did Ultraman with. He's a police officer in New York, Suffolk County. I was on a, this is unbelievable. This is the other million dollar part of the interview. The conversation, Kevin and I took our kids camping in the winter to Mount Washington. Uh, My son was eight. His daughter was eight. And it's snowing, it's freezing. We're in these sleeping bags outside. I said, Kevin, there's 8 billion people in the world. We're the only four people on top of this unbelievable mountain. How often do you do this? There's a police officer. He lights up. He goes, man, every other month since I graduated college, I do something I normally went to done. I said, what are you talking about? He's like, well, instead of watching the football game on Saturday, I'll run a 5K or I'll take my kids fishing, or I'll go to a museum, or I'll sign up for a cooking class. I'll just do something I would have done. I go, why? He goes, because if you do six of those mini adventures every year, and you're 30, and you live to be 70, you'll have 240 mini adventures that you wouldn't have had. I said, that's Kevin. <laughs> no, I said, you're a fucking genius. I said, who can't take one day every other month and do that? So that's Kevin's rule. So when I do my one big, I mean, this is the whole fucking thing right here. If I do my one, my one big event a year and my six mini adventures over the next 40 years, I'll have 40 monumental things and 240 mini adventures I wouldn't have had. I cracked the code, Rachel. (laughs) I cracked the code. No, I cracked the code. People yeah. are like, why are you so happy? What's going on? What's the secret? I planned an unbelievable life. Yeah. Oh, oh how much? Oh, this must be so expensive. No, Mount Washington, it cost $18 to park. That was our cost. $18 to park. Kevin drove. 18 bucks. They're like, what are you talking about? So, yes, I do everything that every, I work. I go to my kids' stuff. I do the. I have responsibilities. My parents are getting older. I'm taking care of my mother. I'm taking care of my mom. All this stuff is happening like everybody else. My kids have glitches, like other kids have glitches. My relationship, we, you know, we have. We, it's good. There's bit, everything everybody has. But I do one big thing a year. I have six mini adventures, and I'm a hell of a networker. Yeah. Marry those things together. You get rich relationships unbelievable life experiences 
and everything else is gravy. Now, I didn't say, I never said how much money's in my bank account. I never, I'm not talking about business. I'm not, I'm talking about living a life, creating a life that's bulletproof because you're, you're over-indexing in experiences. I don't buy art. I don't buy fancy watches. I invest in experiences and things with the people I love to do them with. I put more on my plate of what I love to do with the people I love to do them with. That's how I live my life, man. And, and, and by the way, I've been doing it, I haven't even realized it, but I've been doing it since I'm 20, sleeping on my friend's couches. The only thing is I can do it at, at bigger places, more exotic places, and I can get there more conveniently now. Yeah, higher, that's incredible. Higher, higher thread count on my sheets. Right, right. But I've been doing the same thing since I'm 20, I just didn't realize it, you know? When yeah. I was 20, yeah. I was still going to, still going to the polar plunges, still going to events, still finding unique things in New York City that were, weren't costing me money to experience. I was building up these, and I'm a compilation of that today. Yeah. It's incredible. I, I, I think the biggest takeaway for me and for, I hope, listeners in this is a great life is not going to happen on accident. It's an intention. It's a plan. It's you have to have foresight. You have to look out in advance and ask, you know, it's sort of when I think of like how to be the most productive, I just did an episode on this. My big piece of advice was stop focusing on to do's and start focusing on results. And I think to the same extent, you're like, what is the result that you want to have at the end of 2023? If we're looking at a year from now, what do you want to be able to say that you did and that your life involved? Um, this has been one of the most, um, incredible years for me because I made a commitment on January 1st to do things that terrified me. And so I've just done a bunch of scary shit like swimming with sharks or jumping out of an airplane or doing cold plunges, which I hate cold water. So I know I'm not like you. Um, but I've done all of these things again and again and again, that every time I sort of thought, oh my, that's terrifying. I can't do that. I'm like, well, now you have to. And who I've become in that process and the fear I've been able to let go of, but also the memories I have of right. doing this thing, it was so powerful for me. And I'm like, okay, what's next? What are we going to do now? And taking away from this conversation, I'm always pumped when the audience gets to hear it, but like, I'm geeking out that I got to sit and hear your wisdom. Two things I want to say. First of all, you know, these experiences that you do, it's a gift to your community. Because you do this swim with the shark, do the 29 or 20, do these things, and then you share and inspire from what you learn. That doesn't happen sitting in front of a computer screen. Right. You're, ex you're experiencing things. Look, it's like your business is a perfect example. And then you're sharing it with people. It's no different than someone in an office. When I come into the office and I say, guys, I just did Ultraman. Let me tell you how I got through this. People want to hear about it. So these life resume things are lightning rods for career for your career path and 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 what you can offer people. And the other one thing I want to say about you Rachel is you know you're no fluke. You're no fluke. Like I, people don't realize like um you're really good at sharing um your experiences and breaking them down so everybody can understand it like you know like a 3-year-old can understand it which is a talent and um, you have a wide range of knowledge in a, in a lot of different topics that are really important to people. And you're not a fluke. And what I mean by that is in this space where there's marketing and this and, and, and all this stuff, you can get to a certain point. But I always say this, and I tell this to Sarah, and I'll tell it to your face, and I'll tell it to everybody listening. You're super talented in what you do. You're really you talented. In, you know, you ask good questions. You inspire um, and you, you give a lot of really important, helpful information. And, um, and that's, and, and it's rooted in talent. It's rooted Thank in you. talent. Well, I mean, for what it's worth, and I know you know this, um, it, 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 it's a willingness to suck for a really long time until you get better. <laughs> I think that's worth saying to the audience is anything that we're trying to do. I still am trying to study the craft of interview and, learn how to, to have it be a really great conversation. So I, I hear what you say and I really appreciate it. I totally it. mean it. it, means totally a lot. Mean yeah. it. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I think, um, you know, one last thought I'd love to say and get your perspective on, and then I know you have uh, stuff to do and a life to live, um, is what I found in this process is that even when the experience doesn't go the way that I want it to, even when it's sort of a fail, for lack of a better word, it's still a beautiful experience. So I did 29029, got to the top, did the red hat, did the whole thing, then joined you guys in Whistler. And I was experiencing some health stuff at the time that made it so that I, I've i never done this in my life. And you know me, I'm like, I do marathons, I'll die on this field. I've never had this experience where I was like, oh shit, I my body physically cannot do this anymore. And I had the most amazing experience by stopping which I had never done. I would say I had almost a more profound experience only doing five climbs of Whistler than I did getting to the top of Snow Basin and completing the mission. And I just think it's worth saying because people hear this and like, I want to do these things, but what if I fail? What if I can't finish? What if I, you're gonna learn so much about yourself even if it doesn't go the way that you want it to. It's just about getting out there and doing some shit. So I didn't finish either. You didn't that know feels that. Impossible. I did it. I didn't finish either. I had a bad day. And um, that's to- that stuff never bothers me. I, mm. First of all, I couldn't care less what people say. Oh, Jesse didn't finish. Like that, no, that, take that off the table. This is about me. It just wasn't my day. And that's okay. But here's the lesson. You can be a spectator in life or you can be a participant. You chose and I chose that day to be a participant. It didn't work out. But that's a lot better than sitting on the sidelines and being a spectator and judging you and I saying, oh, it didn't work out. I can't do that. Yeah. You know? So we're, we're participants, man. We're participants in life. And you can be a participant or a spectator. And if you're a participant, it doesn't always work out. If you're a spectator, it never works out. Preach. Oh my gosh. This has been such a gift. I feel like it's already our most popular episode and it hasn't aired yet. So I'm so grateful for the time. Um, If listeners want to find out more about you, can you give us a quick, like, where are the books? I feel like Instagram's where you're most active on social, but tell me, yeah. tell us where to go. Yeah, Instagram, I'm, I'm at Jesse Itzler, my name, uh, or jesseitzler.com. And yeah, that's it. And I appreciate that, Rach. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, yeah, Jesse. Time. This was incredible. Yeah, I was hoping you'd invite me on. Please. I was like, I, this is the thing. I didn't want to ask because I don't want to like pressure friends to like, hey, l- let me, you know, but I finally was like, God, I got to get him to talk about this. Because every time something's on your Instagram where you're talking about life resume, I'm like, absorb. I just like, give me all the wisdom and you did today. So thank you for doing it. it. Give my give my love to Sarah. You have a fantastic week. We'll talk again. Definitely. Soon. I loved it. Thank you, Rach. Okay. Thanks, okay. brother. Bye. I just saw that, that there was all this narcissism everywhere, all this childhood trauma, and I thought there's gonna have to be some sort of scapegoating mechanism to deal with all this narcissistic rage.